which was just as well that we were separated because we didn't get along all that well. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> let me see what's next down here. Oh, then I uh, came to the United States and then I started getting interested in aviation. And <coughs> when I was, uh, <coughs> hang on a sec. My aunt put me in school right away, and uh, my English vocabulary was yes and no at that time. Uh, but you know, when you and I was just just put into this school, everybody speaking English. My teacher did speak German, and she in fact taught some German classes there. I was in the seventh grade then. <coughs> But, uh, you know, when you're a 13-year-old kid and you're put into a situation like that, you, you pick the language up so quickly. And in, in a month I could get along, in three months I was fluent. And uh, I had a, in fact, I had a newspaper route by that time. Um, and I, I got interested in aviation. I heard about the Civil Air Patrol. They, had a, they have a cadet program, so I said, oh yeah, you know, and I, I joined that. I became a Civil Air Patrol cadet in, must have been 1947. I came over in 46, September of 46. <coughs> and uh, so I was in this, this Civil Air Patrol cadet program for, uh, let's see, for about uh, five years until I was 19 years old. I also got interested in model airplanes. This was one of them. I built lots of them, probably a couple dozen over the years. And some of them uh, flew very well, like this one. Um, others, uh, not so well. And, uh, uh, and then when I was 19, I joined the Air Force and I, I uh, Actually, the, the agreement with, with the people who took us in was they would support us until they were 16 and then we would have to get a job and, you know, uh, chip in to, to our own support. Um, so when I was 16, I quit high school and got a job. Uh, now, what I wanted to, the reason I joined the Air Force is because I wanted to become a pilot. And I was actually a pilot by that time because I started flying lessons when I was 18. Uh, it was in a yellow plane there, except it had rounded wingtips instead of the square ones that that one has. Uh, no electrical system, no radio, any, anything like that, no starter started it by flipping, get, get somebody to flip the prop for you. And by, uh, when I was 19, I got my private license, so I already had that <clears throat> when I joined the Air Force. And I was hoping to become a pilot in the Air Force. Um, and while well, I had signed up, I, I wasn't qualified at the time because I didn't, they required a high school diploma. <coughs> And I didn't have one. Uh, so I signed up, well, I'd be an airborne radio operator. So uh, eight weeks of basic training in upstate New York, and then down to Keesler Air Force Base in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, where I learned uh, uh, the, the radios that we were going to have. I also learned Morse code for, I think we were who was six or seven months long. I got up to uh, uh, 20 groups a minute in Morse code. And then when I was assigned to a unit for the rest of the three years that I was in the Air Force, I used Morse code once uh, because <clears throat> the voice transmission has gotten good enough to where we really didn't need Morse code anymore. Most of our transmission was done by voice. Um, so, 
then I, I applied, I, uh, the Air Force offered these five tests that you could take, they were each about two and a half hours long, and if you pass them, then they said, okay, that's the equivalent of a high school diploma. So I did those and I passed them and I said, okay, now I can apply to be a pilot. So I did, and down in Keesler, and I passed the first physical that, um, that they had. They had just uh, medics giving me the eye exam and uh, that went over okay. And then uh, before all the paperwork and all that was done, I graduated there and I went to Hill Air Force Base in a squadron that was just being formed. When I got there, I was, there was a, a master sergeant, a first sergeant, and maybe 12 enlisted men. Uh, and gradually they got more and more officers and a, a commanding officer and started getting airplanes. And uh, it was about 350 people when we got all done with that. But then they said, okay, uh, uh, you've got to go to, to Denver, Colorado to take some more tests to get into the flying program. So they sent me there by train. And I passed the, they had an eight hour written exam. I passed that. They had a, what they call a psychomotor exam where they test your reflexes. I passed that. And then they had another physical where they have ophthalmologists looking at your eyes and I flunked that. <laughs> so I, you know, I, uh, oh my God, my life is over. Uh, and I, uh, I was really all broken up over that. But yeah, in the end, I think it turned out for the best. Um, so I was an airborne radio operator. What have we here? Um, on, on this airplane, a C-124 Globemaster, which was the biggest cargo plane uh, that the Air Force had at the time, propellers, uh, you don't see many of those anymore on military aircraft. Uh, it had two levels, you can see it, a number of windows here and a number of windows here. And uh, I found, I found a, uh, a video online. That's the airplane, this, this is a radar dome now, here. Douglas C-124 Globemaster II. I'm going to kind of skip some of this stuff because it's pretty long and I don't want to go through the whole thing. The 124 is a redesign of the original Glowmaster, the C-70. Pretty crazy. Another prominent feature that we're asked about a lot here is this little distinctive thimble-like nose. Now this contains the APS. Let's go Going to show you the inside okay, now. So here we are inside the 77 foot cargo compartment of the C 124 Globemaster II. Now, these 124s were capable of hauling just about anything at the time tanks, field guns, trucks, bulldozers, you name it, anything up to 74,000 pounds, it was capable of carrying. Now, as you can see, it's also got kind of a second floor, which these side walls could fold down to make an entire second floor, the entire length of the cargo bay, or just as needed, as you see here. But with all these floors down, make two levels, you could actually carry up to 200 fully equipped troops. Or you these huge ramps that you see on either side would uh, hydraulically drop to the floor, to the ground, and that's how you would load outsized cargo. That looks like it's devouring that rocket. Thanks, trucks and the works uh, through the front of the airplane. Now another kind of unique cool feature, I'll show you back here, towards the aft side of 
side of the airplane, we have what they call an elevator. It had a, uh, you can see this part of the floor, that was, that could actually be lowered down. There was uh, doors behind the wing that would open up and then you could lower this section of the floor down with, uh, uh, let's see. There were rails, one on the left side and one on the right side with, uh, with winches, the, uh, they had cables on them and they would uh, connect to the they would connect to these D rings, one on each corner of the thing. They could let it down all the way to the ground, load cargo on there, hoist it up, uh, and uh, then the, the cranes the, the the cranes could pick up the cargo and move it to the more to the front of the aircraft so they could lower that down again and uh, load some more cargo. So you could either use that or those big clamshell doors in the front uh, to load the cargo. Um, let's see. The D range on the corner here. Okay. And then you can lower this all the way to the ground. Lord, whatever, cargo in the let's, let's go up to the cockpit. This was the ladder that led, led up to the cockpit. Okay, so here we are in the flight deck of the 124. Moving forward, you'll see the navigator position over here on the left side. Move over to the right side, get the flight. Now, on, uh, <coughs> on the uh, C-124, model that I was on, they didn't have the, uh, the instruments facing forward like this. The flight engineer sat facing to the side and all these instruments and throttles and mixture control were over here. Wow, your mic is off. Oh, <laughs> my mic is off. <laughs> okay, the, uh, uh, this is the flight engineer's position and he's got all the engine instruments and throttles, mixture control, prop control, but all these instruments were not facing forward, they were on the side here, and the engineer sat here facing the side of the aircraft, uh, uh, and this must be a different model, which uh, I, I never saw that model. Um, okay, then up in the... Pardon? Oh, that's my presentation talking. Instruments and switches. Okay, let's. Okay. Is move forward to the center console. Left side pilot position. That's the co-pilot position. A little bit of the overhead panel up here. Looking towards the back here. Uh, let me go back just a little bit. This is where the radio operator had his uh, position. This was a table. The, it doesn't show the, the receiver, the radio receiver was sitting over here on this bench and, and I was the, I was the uh, radio operator on this plane. And uh, the receiver was here and there was a uh, uh, Morse code key sitting on the table here, which was rarely used. And uh, then let's go forward just a little more. Yeah, this was the seat that I sat in. The uh, transmitter was on this shelf over here. And I, I don't know if this is a transmitter or not. Then there was another unit that we used to tune the antenna to the particular frequency that we're operating on, and that sat up here. Um, and then there were more instruments, circuit breakers. On this side, you got a little galley. This was a toilet in here, in this door. And the galley is, you can see one bunk on that side, and then another bunk. See up above the hatch here. 
behind after the hatch. Another bunk, another little bench. And the hatch goes back down to the cargo bay. Here you can see almost the whole length. Okay, enough of that. Um, Yeah. Uh, okay, so I was uh, stationed in Utah at Hill Air Force Base, and we flew these all over the place. We went out to uh, Japan, we went to the Philippines, and on the way there, uh, we had to stop to refuel in Hawaii, and sometimes we'd stop at Wake Island, otherwise, uh, uh, other times at uh, Kwajalein, which is just a little atoll. Uh, with, it has a runway and a little space to put some buildings on. And uh, Guam we went to, and the uh, Philippines. And uh, also across the ocean, we went to, uh, uh, to England a couple of times. We went to North Africa, to Casablanca once, and to Libya. Uh, that was before the colonel kicked the king out and took over, and then he kicked the... Uh, United States out of there. Um, and, uh, well, uh, I should cut this a little short. Uh, this is another airplane, a DC-4, <clears throat> that I also was a radio operator on. Uh, and I got sent after, after a little over two years in Utah, I got sent up to Iceland for a year where uh, we flew locally, we supplied the outlying radar stations with supplies like food and stuff, flying uh, the DC-3, which in the Air Force they call C-47. And for my last three months after, I had three months to go when I came back from Iceland, and I flew on this, which was, uh, you can see it has a big belly, there was a radar antenna in here, another one, uh, on top, and we would fly, this was uh, McClellan Air Force Base out of California, we would fly about 300 miles out over the Pacific, and then for 12 to 15 hours we would just fly back and forth and uh, make sure that there weren't any Russian airplanes coming to, to bomb the United States. Uh, so then, yeah, I was doing that for the, my last three months, and in uh, August of 56, then, I, uh, my four years were up, and I got discharged. Uh, one, another aviation activity that I did, I uh, started in, uh, must have been about 1984. I built my own uh, airplane, and this was kind of the first flight. Uh, I built it in my basement. I had a big window in the back that I could get the parts out of. Uh, here's, here it is when it was uh, much more finished. The wings were done. I still had a cover. The fuselage was covered with fabric. And uh, then finally it was done. Uh, and I flew it for about 110 hours or so. This isn't part of the airplane, that's a snowblower in the background. And uh, then in 1998, I think it was in July 1998, I, uh, uh, the Civil Air Patrol was having an aviation safety seminar in Bismarck, and I was going to go there, and I almost made it, but I landed a little early. And uh, that's my nice airplane there. Uh, usually when it's on the ground, it's the other way around. <laughs> but uh, no, I didn't get hurt. Well, I got hurt a little bit. I had a cut on my head that bled profusely for about two minutes and then it quit. And it turned out I, it turned out I had a hairline fracture in one of my shoulder blades. But other than that, and the plane didn't get all that much damage. Uh, the, I had intended to land, I had picked out a dirt road after the engine quit, and uh, I was going to land on that 
one road. I had one more turn to make, but I was fairly low and I didn't see the power line there. So my low wing caught on the power line and put me into a 90 degree bank, uh, which I managed to correct for. Uh, but then I w was over the ditch instead of the road and I had lost the rest of my altitude. So it plopped down in the ditch and was rolling along and I was hoping, oh, maybe it's still. But then the wheels ran into a real dense patch of weeds and the wheels stopped and the rest of the plane didn't. Over it went. Um, but like I said, I, I was lucky I didn't get hurt. I got a nice letter from the uh, FAA. Uh, the matter does not warrant legal enforcement action and they were going to put a letter in my records for two years and then expunge it so that was kind of nice of them. <laughs> then, uh, it, oh I had joined the Civil Air Patrol here uh, in uh, 90, oh I went to, uh, after I got out of the Air Force I worked for a while yet and then I said hey I got the GI Bill might as well use it so I went to college I graduated with a degree in physics and uh, then I went to grad school in Pittsburgh, the University of Pittsburgh, where I, after uh, some years I did finally finish my uh, doctorate degree. So I'm a high school dropout but I have a PhD. Uh, one of the thing after, uh, when was this about, must have been around 20 or 2006, uh, we got a glider in the Civil Air Patrol program. This was the first glider that we got. And it was a pretty nice glider. It had about a 20 to 1 glide ratio. Uh, but then we, uh, in about 2010 or so, we got a much nicer one. This is a Blahnik L23. And two-seater, they were both two-seaters. And I got my uh, glider rating uh, in Civil Air Patrol. And here's a few pictures. This is a tow plane. Uh, the glider has already took and taken off from the ground, but he has to stay very low because if he starts climbing, he'll pull up the tail of the tow plane and that w w could lead to bad things. Here, we are up in the air, the tow plane with the glider in tow. And there you can see the two of them. And here the glider is landing. And then uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the missions that the Civil Air Patrol does, uh, in initially in the, the Civil Air Patrol got started about a week before Pearl Harbor. And then in World War II, on the Atlantic coast, uh, the Civil Air Patrol did a lot of patrolling over the ocean and they found quite a few German U-boats and uh, radioed that in and then the, the military planes came over and uh, either sunk them or chased them out of there. Uh, then uh, later we became a search, uh, search and rescue, we got a search and rescue mission we looked for missing airplanes uh, for quite a while, but now uh, if a plane crashes, it has an emergency locator transmitter and the, the ones, they have been much improved and what they do now is they're connected to the GPS system. They not only put out an emergency signal, they also put out the coordinates where they're at. So we don't really need to go look for them anymore because uh, they, they, they tell the rescue people where they're at. Uh, another mission is uh, <clears throat> uh, when there's a disaster or uh, some other kind of emergency. In the Red River Valley, every once in a while we get a pretty good flood. And this was, I think, the 09, uh, 2009, we had a big flood. This is the Red River Valley. This here is the Red River. But you can see it has spread out to where it looks more like the original Lake Agassiz that it, uh, that it was when uh, the Ice Age was receding. So these are some of the pictures that 
we took from that. And uh, with that, we are at the end of the thing. And uh, just a, another observation about life. Life has, a, has an end as well as a beginning. And, uh, well, we all get there eventually. Some people have had uh, near-death experiences. And what they report is the, what it's like, you know, their, their heart stops for a few minutes, but then they get uh, resuscitated and they, they come back to life. But what a lot of them report is that they have a, an experience, and that experience is that um, they're like going through a tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel, there's a bright light. Hmm. Amazing. Sounds familiar. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. If there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, sir. My pa oh, uh, well, they uh, got divorced the second time when they were still over in Germany. And when I was 21, I sponsored my mother and sister to come over to the United States. Now, I was in the Air Force at the time, and I bought a, a little house out on Long Island, two bedroom, living room, kitchen, and a bathroom for $5,990. That was in 1954. They're more expensive today. <laughs> Ellen, my question was, uh, if you had seen your parents, when, since you got to America, when you answered that. My other question is, uh, where did you meet your wife? Germany or? Oh, uh, it turned out that uh, my mother had a had her best friend over here, uh, and uh, that best friend was also my godmother, and uh, she sponsored, she uh, had a, uh, a niece in Germany that was in her, her 20s, 24 or so, 24, 25, and uh, she was a nurse, and uh, she said, hey, uh, why don't you come to the United States? And so she sponsored her. She sent her a ticket to come over. And uh, so she came over. And then next time, we, uh, my mother and I went to visit my mother's best friend. This nurse person was over there, too. And uh, we right away clicked. and. Uh, it was in the winter when she came over. Uh, that first time went over, when we went over there, oh, she, she stuffed a snowball down my back. And, <laughs> and that kind of sealed the thing. I do, yes, it's a tiny little town on the, along the railroad to Minot, right? Yeah. And I grew up 10 miles from there. Pardon? So I grew up 10 miles from there, and the school bus that I was on went through Bremen. Oh, okay. And I knew that was yeah. after a big German town. Yeah. Yes. It's quite a bit smaller than the German city. <laughs> I think it's one little building right now. <laughs> then I was like 10 or 15 buildings and some, you know. Houses and Main Street. And uh -huh. Used to have some dances there. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, yes, thank you, Grandma. Okay, I guess they serve food here if you want to. I've got one for you. Well, I have heard that the C124 was. Uh, Shaky, it was called old shaky. Did yes, you yes. Comment on that? It, it was, it, it uh, deserved the name. <laughs> uh, and it, it was, uh, it was, the fuselage was higher than it was wide. 
And so instead of shaking this way, it shook this way. <laughs> and uh, you had to kind of get used to that, but uh, yeah, that's why it was called shaking. There another feature when it was taxiing, the brakes would make a god awful squeal. <laughs> and I, I've never seen that on any other plane, but it really screeched when it was when they applied the brakes when they were taxiing. I have one other one. Did you, with your physics, did you actually teach somewhere? I did do that, yes. Uh, guilty as charged. Um, more at state. I got a job after I uh, finished at uh, Pittsburgh. I came up here, got interviewed, and got hired in 1968, that was. And then I taught physics there for until 1994. And I also got into astronomy. We, start, we started an astronomy program in the physics department. Uh, so that, that was... Uh, I, I was really got into, interested in astronomy then. It was a very interesting subject. I, I taught it. I developed some even senior level courses in astronomy. And then in 94, I had an opportunity to go to uh, Malaysia to teach physics. They, they were starting a program there in the Malaysian University uh, in concert with the University of Indiana and several other universities. Uh, and uh, so I, I retired early from Moorhead State, four years early. I went to Malaysia for two years, I taught physics there. And we got to travel around there quite a bit too. And it was a very interesting area there. Um, uh, it's uh, it's a supposedly a third world country, but they had uh, traffic jams that will compete with any of ours. Um, so until, and then I came back from there in uh, November of 1996 and retired for good, and I've been retired ever since. Uh, big drain on the social security system. Yes. Uh, how did you build the plane in the basement? Um, yeah, well, uh, it was, the space there was big enough, and uh, it, it was a, it's a Sonorai 2, two-place airplane uh, powered by a Volkswagen engine. And uh, the fuselage is built out of steel tubes, and I, I didn't really know how to weld, so I, uh, as a friend of mine showed me how to just tack things together, and I did that. And then when I had a fuselage all tacked together, and he came over two or three nights and welded it all together properly. Uh, the, the wings are all aluminum, the spar and the ribs and the skin is all aluminum. With pop, the skin is on with pop rivets. Uh, and uh, yeah, the uh, and then you know there's an instrument panel with the minimum instrument. I did put a turn coordinator in there just in case I ever blundered into a cloud that I wouldn't uh, completely lose it. And it, it flew pretty well. It cruised at about a 140 miles per hour, which I think is about a is that about 120 knots. Uh, so it, it did pretty good. It was very light on the controls, and I did. Uh, I had a when I first finished it, the FAA inspected it and uh, said it was good. And uh, they assigned me. You get assigned a, a fairly restricted area for the first 40 hours, and you have to fly in there. Uh, and if you want to do any aerobatic maneuvers, you have to do that during those 40 hours. So I, I did tail spins up to three, I mean up to six complete spins. And it has a, the wingspan is only about 19 feet. So it really warmed up in those tail spins. And, and I did rolls, sort of, and uh, loops. 
So those three maneuvers were, you know, approved by the FAA. Yeah, and then, yeah, I flew it, well, I flew it to Ashkash twice, uh, and flew it uh, here in, in the local area to Minot and other places. Uh, and it was a nice plane to fly, but then after, after the mishap, um, I started to repair it. It turned out this had a, a dual electronic ignition. There were no magnetos. And it turned out that the, the main wire that supplied the two electronic ignitions got too hot and burned through. And uh, then on my way to Bismarck, I mean, the engine just, it didn't cough or sputter, it just quit. And it was it. And uh, I had rewired the whole thing so that that wouldn't happen again. But then, I don't know, I guess after five years, I just wasn't doing it anymore. So uh, I said, I guess I'm not going to fix it. So I donated it to the Air Museum. Got a pretty hefty uh, tax deduction for that. And uh, then it sat out at, uh, in a hangar at uh, Castleton Airport for a number of years, and then finally a, a friend of mine from West Fargo bought it for, I think it was 1250 bucks or something like that. He got a good deal. The engine was okay, and the, the, the airplane wasn't much damaged. It did need a new canopy because the canopy had sh shattered when the thing went over on its back. So, and uh, a couple of years ago, I helped him restore it, and I think it's almost ready now to fly again. <coughs> I haven't seen it now in a, in a, during the COVID experience. I haven't seen it for a year or two, but I'm going to go out there and visit him one of these days, see how it's going. He hopes to fly it again. Does, does that answer? Your, yeah. Commander of the North Dakota Civil Air Patrol, you probably discuss that a little bit. And talk about the quality of airplanes that you, you fly here in North Dakota. Very high quality airplanes. Yeah, I was a uh, wing commander for the North Dakota wing of Civil Air Patrol from 02 to 06. I'm currently the uh, Inspector General, um, and the. Yeah, the airplanes, the Air Force really has given us some really nice airplanes there. Uh, mostly Cessna 180, we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, I guess we have five, 5, Cessna 182s and two Cessna 172s. And they're, they're new, we got them as new airplanes right out of the factory. They have uh, uh, the, the the G1000, it's a glass cockpit instead of having all those round gauges that has two big screens. And one of them shows the uh, uh, the altitude and the airspeed and direction and all that. The other is a big moving map that can also show the weather. So they're, they're really nice airplanes that they've gotten for us, plus that glider that we have. So. Um, does that answer it? Yeah. Okay. Okay then, I guess we're done. So you're only just a runoff between a 90 and a person, right? 89 hertz, 89? Pardon? You're 89, right? Uh, no, I'm about three weeks shy of that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my... My wife and I have been really blessed uh, health-wise. Uh, we're both 88, I'm about to turn 89, and uh, we haven't had much in the way of uh, uh, health problems, so we've really, been, we've really been blessed on that account. Thank you. Thank you.
celebrate our birthday together. I'm going to be 89 and then the 15th of August. 15th? Minus 13th. <laughs> well, thank you all. We really appreciate it. Great stories. Um, just as a couple quick reminders, we do have our fall fundraiser on September 24th. Uh, we do have some more information on the website. That is our uh, largest fundraiser of the year. So please check that out. And uh, we also have our next quarterly history night in October. So uh, keep an eye out on our website for our next, uh, next upcoming events. And again, big round of applause to Walt. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you for your support. Have a great night.